Newtown, New Jersey for part eight of the Lackawanna Cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And here we are on the grounds of Blair Academy at the grave of John Inslee Blair, for whom Blairstown is named. They should know that there's more than one Blairstown, as a matter of fact. Uh, there's only one Blairstown in New Jersey, uh, but there's a Blairstown in Iowa, Missouri. Uh, there's a Blairsburg in uh, Nebraska. Uh, there's a Blair, N Nebraska, which is actually slightly larger than Blairstown, New Jersey. All of these towns are named after John I. Blair uh, from here in Blairstown, New Jersey. Now, if we've, as we've talked about several different times in different episodes for the Lackawanna Cutoff, John I. Blair played a key role in the building of the Old Road, the Lackawanna Old Road. Blair was general contractor, financier, uh, he promoted the, 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 the building of the old road. Uh, he basically did everything. Now the thing is that Blair was not the type of person to want to operate a railroad. During the course of today, we have several stops to make. And one of them will be to look at the beginning point of his own railroad here in, in Blairstown, the Blairstown Railway. Uh, after we leave the, uh, the gravesite here, uh, we're gonna, just going to take a look at a, a few things around town briefly that from a point of view where, from the, the movies and so forth that uh, add notoriety to Blairstown. Then we'll go to what is now Footbridge Park. Uh, we'll also go up to, of course, the Blairstown Station here in, in Blairstown on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Uh, then we also want to take a look at a bridge and then we're going to do a, a short archaeological expedition on the cutoff uh, also in Blairstown. Uh, just to say a little bit about John Blair, he was born in 1802 and died in December of 1899. He, if he lived just a little bit longer, he could have lived in three different centuries, uh, but certainly he lived throughout the 19th century and became one of the wealthiest men in America, if not the world. Uh, he died with a, a fortune that was estimated at about $70 million, and if you can imagine, converting from $1899 to $2017, that uh, he would be probably, in the, in the, certainly in the top 100, if not the top 10, most wealthiest people in, in America today. Uh, part of his endowment was Blair Academy, uh, which is a, a, a well-renowned preparatory school here in the United States. And it's actually known internationally, as a matter of fact, as well. So when Blair died, he left quite a, a story behind him. Now we should know that there's an interesting story behind how Blairstown, New Jersey became named. Uh, it, over the years, it was known by several different other names. Uh, originally Smith's Mill, then it became uh, Butts Bridge, then Gravel Hill, and uh, that uh, Gravel Hill in 1825 to be exact. Uh, I guess the residents of what would become Blairstown didn't like any of those names over that time and when Blair became postmaster and I guess became the most important man in town, they thought it made perfect sense to name the town after him which happened about 1847, somewhere in there, I believe. So, and ever since, it's, uh, that's, this has been Blairstown. And this is the man for whom Blairstown is named. So, our next stop is to poke around a little bit in town, look at some sites which, um, for you moviegoers, especially, I'll say, the, from the horror genre, it should be quite familiar.
feel like I need a backpack, like the, the girl was wearing in Friday the 13th who came down one of the, one of the shots in the, the original movie that was shot here in, in Blairstown, as a matter of fact. Uh, 1980, um, about 10 years after rail service and the cutoff ended, but um, the, the movie was shot here in Blairstown primarily, uh, in this area, the, the diner, for example, here at the, well, at this spot, um, at the mill, uh, we also see shots from in Hope. The main part of the movie is shot up in Hardwick Township, which is the next town over at uh, what they call in the movie Camp Crystal. Um, uh, Camp Blood, as they refer to it as. It's, it's, a, it's a horror movie, if anyone, if anyone of you have ever seen Friday the 13th. But that said, that the most famous movie that's ever been shot here in Blairstown. Um, other than John Blair, who is probably the most famous person that's, uh, uh, that would come to, to Blairstown? Um, Babe Ruth, the, the baseball player. He would, from time to time, show up in Blairstown. Uh, he would go to the Blairstown Inn. The old Blairstown Inn, there's a, a Blairstown Inn today, nice place to visit, I recommend stopping in there. And they had memorabilia uh, from Babe Ruth. But the original Blairstown Inn, I believe, was up the, the street here. This is Main Street in Blairstown. Um, uh, Ruth would, from time to time, uh, come in. And um, he was known to be a um, one who liked to party at carouse. You know, that was you know, in those days, 1930s, certainly. Um, so in any case, uh, this is downtown Blairstown. Uh, we're going to go across the way, just across the uh, Poland's Kill and go to John Blair's railroad station and it's a railroad station area which is today known as Footbridge Park. Here we are at Footbridge Park in Blairstown, New Jersey. Why is it called Footbridge Park? Well, if you follow me, there's Footbridge. Uh, before the cutoff was built was just up here uh, in this direction would have been towards Hawthorne and this direction uh, would have been towards well basically Columbia but also would have been towards uh, uh, Pennsylvania because the line did actually go that far uh, one of the I don't know what to call it, but one of the things that's come up over the years is about John Blair and his influence over the, uh, the cutoff. Uh, had he lived, which of course he didn't, he, he wasn't going to live to be 120 years old, but that had Blair still been alive at the time that the cutoff was being built, that there might have been some way he would have influenced the line being closer to the town of Blairstown. Now, if you if I walk around here and you look at the topography, there's this hill here, and that just keeps going on and on and up. The cutoff is well above us here. And when I say well above us, that we're talking probably at least 100 feet or more in elevation. I'm, I'm only guessing. And the cutoff is actually going in this direction, a, a southwesterly direction. And near Blairstown is one of the steepest, relatively speaking, steepest grades on the cutoff. There's absolutely no way the engineers who were building the cutoff would have ever thought about bringing the cutoff any closer to the, the town of Blairstown. There would have been no, it would have made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, and as we, when we go up to the station, which is our next stop, we get an idea that it's actually a very nice spot and from a, a sort of a, a, a window or a, a gateway to the town. It's certainly a, a, a very nice spot where it is. That, not that the black one planned it that way, it was just that because the way, the, in order to get from 
let's say Johnsonburg to the Delaware Water Gap, the alignment of the cutoff really brought it well above this area. So the, anyway, I'm, I'm beating sort of a dead horse that there was no way that the, the Lackawanna would have made any sense for them to bring the, that line any closer to here. Now talking about the Blairstown Railway, which is started here and went all the way to Delaware, which we talked about in the old road, uh, which would have been part six, the why the cutoff was built. Uh, Blair, uh, as we've talked about, uh, we don't really think that John I. Blair built the Blairstown Railway to allow his elderly wife to go shopping in New York. She might have used it for that purpose, but even at his age, which was about 75, uh, in that would have been uh, 1877 when the uh, Blairstown Railway was being built, uh, Blair was thinking ahead. Th this area here is not conducive to building a railroad. And Blair knew that if he built a railroad first, that he also knew that there was also another railroad, uh, the New Jersey Midland at that time, that was thinking about coming here towards the, the water gap, that if he built his line first, they might want to buy it from him. And in fact, that is what happened. He only operated, and I'm not sure that he himself actually had anything to do with the operation. He wasn't the type to want to operate a railroad. He, he liked to build railroads, but he didn't like to operate them. But that, that the railroad only briefly would have operated as the Blairstown Railroad and then became part of the, well, New York, uh, the New Jersey Midland, and then very shortly thereafter, the New York Susquehanna and Western Railroad, which operated uh, the this section of line all the way until about 1960 or so, 1961. Uh, there are actually two railroads that operated here on the, where I'm physically I'm standing. This is actually it was a rail yard. Uh, there was an old coal dock that was over here where they would dump coal. Um, the Lehigh and New England Railway would actually uh, come through here, but on trackage rights. What that means is that they didn't actually own the railroad but they had, but they, they pay a certain fee and had the right to run over this section of the railway here. Uh, as we'll find out in a future episode, uh, the Lehigh and New England actually had planned uh, a, a different alignment, which would have gone through a different part of Blairstown and actually had an effect upon the cutoff. But that's a story from another time. So, off we are to Blairstown Station, the cutoff. We're finally getting to the cutoff and we're going to take a look at the station there. And now I'd like to reintroduce Mr. Jerry Cruz who is the owner of the Cruz General Store in Johnsonburg, New Jersey. We interviewed him for the Johnsonburg episode a few episodes ago and he spoke about Blairstown and in that episode and uh, here's some additional footage which we some of which you've seen and some of which you have not seen if you've seen that particular episode. Um, so uh, here is some recollections from the past from Mr. Jerry Crew. Yep. So what year is this? This is, looks like, is this, well, I guess late 40s. Okay. Is that eastbound or westbound? Any I guess? That we go eastbound. Eastbound. So he's going up there. Okay. Hmm. Oh, there's some boral pits down in here and stuff that... Uh, yeah, they, they said about the boral pits, but... Uh, oh, I always thought they were a man-made lake, you know, natural lakes, but no, they were boral pits to fill the water, you know. We saw a couple, there's a little on the dry side, because it's been, hasn't been a lot of we rain. Said, we used to take the train all the time out of Blairstown in New York, but my brother and I we used to go watch Yankees, and the Rangers, you know. Hockey in the garden. You know. So, which train, like for example, I, I don't know if it would be like the Phoebe Snow or what would it be like one of the. Uh, Phoebe uh, Snow was like 5 30 at night, come going this way. There was a train number six, five, six, six. Came about 10 after 7 in the morning. Then there was one about train number 40. Came about 
10 minutes to 10 in the morning. And uh, oh, what else did he have? TV snow came at 5.30. I have an old timetable, I can tell you exactly, but I have a home. But you're saying you, you, you climb aboard, get the, the you take the train in, see the Yankees play, come yeah. back at night, it's obviously. Back at night. After. I was trying to up to 450, I was trained at 43. <coughs> then there was one at 730, that was number five, that was going to Chicago. 43 went to Scranton. Then there was a late, late night one, train number. 15, that was the AL newspaper train that did not stop in Blairstown, but if you bought the conductor of pizza or something, you could stop it in Blairstown. Oh, okay. Okay. Two? Okay. Mm -hmm. One guy used to smoke candle cigarettes, he gave a pack of cigarettes, he stopped the train. He gave two packs, he stopped in Johnsonburg, and he found out he'd get fired, you know. Did, when did it, do you remember any time where there was a, a trains that would stop at Johnsonburg other than you know, no in the forties in the forties and after that no my, my mother worked in New York she used to take the train at all the time in the forties out of Johnsonburg out of Johnsonburg it really? was a, I have an old nineteen forty eight timetable home that would tell you there wasn't too many trains to stop but there was there used to be a train called forty seven. That would come out of Hoboken, go to Scranton. It was a mail and express train. It stopped at every station you could think of. And this was before United Parcel and FedEx. There was no such thing as United Parcel and FedEx in the 50s. So it would stop in Johnsonburg, let off packages. If you had a, a Sears robot catalog and you ordered stuff out of it, it would come by train. And there was a guy up here named Pop Quick. He was an old guy. He had an old Plymouth station wagon. He, his job was to go to the, meet the train, bring the stuff to the post office, and bring the mail back, back up. And there was a mail catcher up here for Eastbound and Westbound. And he'd put the mail bag up on the mail catcher and then pick up the one they kicked off. He'd go twice a day, once for Eastbound, once for Westbound. Oh, wow. Okay, there was mail catchers. Blairstown had one. Greendale had one, but I don't remember Greendale. Johnsonburg had two, one for Eastbound, one for Westbound. Now, was anybody in, in the station, uh, what, well, uh, let's put it this way, at what point did the railroad pull like, the agent out? Or, uh, yeah, a long time ago. A long time ago. Is it, it, when I was a kid, it was a track department. Put their truck into the old baggage room track department was in the station, not, not an agent. There was an agent in Blairstown for quite a while, within the late 60s anyway. Because that was a much was bigger... A, there was John Riley, there was, uh, I forget his name, he lived in Pennsylvania. Moyer, I guess his name was Moyer. They sold tickets, I mean, you know, we, I remember there were people that actually commuted from yeah. Blairstown. That train 43, like I said, left New York at 4.50, got here about 20 after 6. A lot, I remember a lot of people getting off that train. Hmm. Yeah. That's why I think if they ever put it back and ran the train when people wanted to go and brought it back when they wanted to come back, it would. I think they'd have enough traffic. That's, that's certainly the idea. Look at March Line, they go back and forth all day long between Scranton and Wilkesbury, New York. You can't even get a seat on a bus, you know, they're just so full. Mm -hmm. When I was there, the March Line and the railroad, the tickets were interchangeable. So if you bought a round trip ticket from Blairstown, let's say from Strasburg to New York, your return ticket, even though it says railroad, was good on the March Line. Yeah. Really? Yeah. If they did that again, it be real good. Well, I don't know if we get March to agree to that, but like I guess we'll have to Mount see. Arlington Station there. See, that's a new station. I told them to build a station here. We, you're going to get all kinds of people. Let me go down there. The parking lot's full. You know, the buses stop there. The train stops there. Mount Arlington. There's 
sort of 80 over there. Exit 30. Then okay. they made a beautiful station there. You got an elevator in it, but well lit. Yeah, the only problem there is parking. They don't it's have enough. Parking. I'm a parking. Yeah. I told them to build a station here. That's new. That's only been there ten, ten, twelve years. And they're supposed to add more parking on the other side because there's there are times you can go in there and there's there's nothing available. You can't yeah. you can't park. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've you've really given this they, quite a bit. Um, they've done that before. I mean, uh, the worst I saw was Princeton Junction on the on the northeast corridor. They got parking spots there that I, I don't know. That people have them in their wills to give to the kid the parking space at the station. Wow. Because they're, they're so scarce. They built another station in the West and Hamilton with a big parking garage. It's real nice, you know, because of the overflow from Princeton. You couldn't get a place to park here. Yeah, you know, they were parking on the guys' lawns. They were parking along Route One there. The cops are having a fit. Well, there's definitely a demand for, for rail service. I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's a question of um, um, putting it putting it back. In this case, it's a little more complicated because the tracks aren't there now, but that's uh, something that we're working on. I know. This I like to, I'm not going to see it in my time, but I'd like to see the track come back. You know, I'm all for it. People say, oh, it's going to bring uh, development. No, this track has been going over 40 years had the development without the railroad, you know, they came anyway. The railroad's not going to have anything to do with the development. Probably Route 80 had a lot to do with that. 80 had a lot to do with it, too, you know. Well, Blairstown used to have a freight business there. They had J.C. Roy used to get cars there. Blairstown Press got newsprint. Uh, I'm sure there was lumber cars in there, but I remember freight going in and out. And when they built Fox Island, a lot of big heavy by railroad on the, you know, the heavy flat cars. Early 60s, early, right? Early Somewhere around there. there. Yeah, they had a, but it just wasn't enough to sustain it, especially when Conrail came, because the, the Conrail's job was to tear up track. You know, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You know, make the rest viable. I mean, you had six lines going from Buffalo to the city. You had Lackawanna, you had the Erie, we had Valley, New York Central. Pennsylvania, you know, you, there was just duplicate lines. Mm -hmm. And this one here just didn't have enough uh, local business to sustain it, you know. So Conrail, like I said, what they don't want, they, they scrapped, sold everything right down to the bottom, and what they kept, they, uh, they really fixed up. You know. Here we are at Blairstown Station. We're physically on what would have been the westbound track of the Lackawanna Cutoff. Rail service began here Christmas Eve 1911, but this station wasn't ready when the, when the cutoff opened. What happened was that there was still ongoing uh, discussions and disputes, I guess you would say, with the landowner, and the actual station did not open until sometime in early 1912. Um, this was a place which was really, for many years, the uh, or you'd say the, uh, the transportation hub for Blairstown. Uh, the, uh, the, the railroad, the Lackawanna, and then later on the Erie Lackawanna, provided service uh, from here to, well, not only to Hoboken, but in this direction, westbound to Buffalo, New York, uh, Chicago. You could have gotten a train from here to St. Louis, as a matter of fact. You'd have to change at Buffalo, but you could have done that. Uh, the, I remember talking to uh, older folks here in Blairstown who said that uh, people would get off the train here and uh, some would have skis this time of year and they would ski down to the middle of Blairstown to maybe Rocco's Villa or, or, or somewhere else in Blairstown. Uh, certainly the days before they maybe they would have uh, uh, gone around and plowed every single road so you could have done a lot of uh, cross-country skiing. but. Um, the, the, this was uh, actually very well liked, apparently, by people who used the service. Some people commuted from here, um, but many people used it on weekends um, or to go on trips or even used it for, for school. So, in any case, um, Blairstown Station, um, 
our next stop will be we're going to go up there to the bridge or actually it's bridges that cross over the cutoff uh, there's a little bit of a story behind those in terms of preservation of the line and uh, that and after that we're going to do our little archaeological expedition here we are on what used to be route 521 or known as hope blairstown road if you look at old photos this is actually a hairpin turn that existed when the cutoff was built. The, the station is down below and this is the, the right of way of the, of the old county road. If we do a turn around here, you can see that there actually are two bridges here. Uh, originally there was only one bridge. one that is closest to us. Uh, in 2005, a second bridge was added uh, such that the roadway here was reconfigured. Now, why am I even talking about this? In 1987, uh, there I came before the Blairstown uh, Council um, urging them to adopt a resolution to support the preservation of this bridge because this bridge was on a hairpin turn was up placement by the county we also I also went to the county for uh, the, the freeholder board for a resolution as well what was important about that was that the proposal was to take out the bridge and fill it in with basically dirt or film material which would have obstructed the right-of-way and not only would have physically obstructed the right-of-way, but would have symbolically obstructed the right-of-way. So, long story short, we were able to get support to actually not only reconfigure the road, but add a, a second bridge, as it turned out, as the way that was the, the solution was for the problem of this particular hairpin turn. So, that was just one step for pre pre preserving the cutoff and to uh, uh, assure that when rail service would return, uh, that this would be one less impediment that would have to be overcome. So, our next and last stop will be, I keep calling it an archaeological expedition. Um, one of the folks that is involved with the, uh, who's a historian, he no longer lives in Blairstown, but he did for a number of years, and um, he now lives in Ohio, Fred Heilich, and uh, he asked that we do a little bit of uh, poking around and that's where we're going to go to uh, to poke around and see if we can find a couple of things that uh, you see in an old photograph we'll see if they still exist here today here we are on the bridge over the cutoff on Silver Lake Road technically this is Freeling Heisen Township but we'll call it close enough to Blairstown we're really not that far from Blairstown we're here to look for two things. We'll show you a photograph or a couple of photographs of this location um, from the 1920s. Um, essentially, we're going to see if we can locate the foundation of the section house, which is off on the left side of the cut over here. And then down below, we'll see, I don't know if we can or not, but we'll look and see if we can find where the actual Lackawanna which was written in the side of in in a whitewash on the side of the the cutoff literally on rocks over here right below this this uh, this bridge that the the section house uh, workers who took care of this particular section of the cutoff uh, would keep up and sort of as a um, a sign and uh, just out of a sign of of pride. So, in any case, here we go on our short archaeological expedition. Okay, here we are under the Silver Lake Road Bridge. Uh, we've tried, we've, we've gone off into the distance here and looked for first the foundation for the section house. Um, according to the photograph, it should be very close to this house, which, which you can't see from here, but the house in the photo looks like it's the same house that's here today and there's no sign of the foundation, so it's possible the Lackawanna uh, may have removed the foundation. Uh, really can't tell. Now, 
In terms of the, the Lackawanna sign, and this is brought to my attention by uh, Fred Heilich, who, uh, who's, I believe, his grandfather, uh, Jacques uh, Belay, uh, was the, the foreman for this section of the cutoff. Um, and that crew would basically take care of the, the track, probably most likely during the summertime, but they would, uh, they would maybe remove old ties or uh, knock in spikes. In those days, they actually used screw spikes, not necessarily the ones that you have to knock in with a, a sledgehammer. But right over here is the, um, the place where the, the Lackawanna and uh, whitewash would have been. Probably have to come back maybe with uh, some shovels and stuff and because there's a lot of uh, very nice dirt that's uh, uh, from probably leaves over the years accumulating and, and uh, decomposing. But um, I don't know if we could actually get down to the surface where we'd actually see where the sign is, but it should be right here. I mean, it's where it was right next to the bridge. So in any case, uh, so I can't say that we were successful. We tried, but uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes you don't always look, find what you're looking for. So in any case, and I even brought my trusty broom along, which uh, didn't really help very much in the snow, but uh, you know, maybe next time. So uh, here we are at the end of part eight of the Lackawanna Cutoff. Uh, hope that you will look forward to the next part, or the next episode on the Lackawanna Cutoff.